and welcome to our second week of our summer speaker series. It is a pleasure to welcome Thank you. Uh, someone who is really fast becoming a, a very good friend, uh, Dr. Ivan Rusin. He's the president of the Ukrainian Evangelical Theological Seminary. And um, I will forego the rest of uh, my introduction, uh, his esteemed education and career, and you will hear about the vital ministry that his seminary and that he is a part of uh, ministering to the nation of Ukraine. Yeah, well, this is my privilege uh, to be together with you today. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry for my English. I was suffering learning English and you will be suffering now uh, listening to my English. So we are quit. <laughs> so let me share about our ministry during the war. And um, uh, as you know that uh, 15 months ago, uh, there was a like, full-scale war started in Ukraine. And before everything else, I, will, I want to say thank you for your prayers, for your support, for everything you do uh, for our country. Without global support, without uh, support from churches, we wouldn't survive. We wouldn't survive uh, physically. And uh, I want to tell you that this war is as full, as wild as it can be. Uh, Putin has used all kinds of weapons besides nuclear weapon. So we've seen everything that they have. And there is no safe place in Ukraine because they are attacking uh, all Ukraine, sending the rockets, drones uh, to, to our land. This war has a significant impact on our society more than six millions are internally displaced. It means that they had to leave their homes. More than nine millions are internet, they are refugees. They had to leave the country. And this is a real photo from the city of Kharkiv where people desperately want to leave the city and move toward West Ukraine. Uh, so uh, thousands and thousands of families are separated because of the war for 15 months. And this will have huge impact, negative impact on our society. Millions of people lost their houses. And for us, um, you know, we are not traveling as you do in the United States. For us uh, to stay in your parents' house is like a sacred. So uh, usually people says, this house belonged to my family for three generations, and now I lost it. And we say, no, this is not your fault. So beyond all kind of economical uh, problem, it also has, you know, a significant psychological problem. More than seven million uh, children are children of war. You know, for a couple of months, we were pretended that we are strong. You know, we have no trauma, you know, but then we realized that all of us have trauma. And what I learned from, from my own experience, trauma can show up later. And sometimes you discover how it impacts your life. So for example, I, am, I got used to real explosions, but now when I, when I hear thunder, you know, really like something like unpleasant inside of me. But before the war, I used to love, uh, for example, rain and thunder and these children this trauma will be with them for entire life. How do we take care for them so we can, you know, heal them? This is a real photo again in the city of uh, Kharkiv. A young, uh, like 11 or 12 boy, he was killed by Russian missile. And this is his father who was standing there for a couple of hours praying and holding his son's uh, hand. And a Ukrainian police lady, she tried to uh, support him. Hundreds and thousands of apartments are being destroyed. Educational institution, medical institution have been destroyed and churches. More than 300 churches have been destroyed. And this is, you know, um, if you are Protestant, evangelical or Catholic, you have a big problem because Russian soldiers, they are absolutely intolerant toward uh, other religious traditions. So if you are a pastor of evangelical church, you will be persecuted. Your church might be destroyed or it might take, uh, they be taken from you and turn it to be like offices, uh, store and something like that. 
you may wonder why Ukrainians fight as they fight. Because this war is not about land. This war is about our identity, our culture, our values. This war is about the very existence of a, of a separate ethnic group. So for us, it's clear to live, to fight or to die. And this is not the first attempt of Russian empire to destroy our nation. 1933, there was a man-made famine. Millions of Ukrainians died because of that. And by the way, the world learned about that catastrophe because of an American journalist. He was in Ukraine and somehow he, he managed to make some photos and secretly he left Ukraine and published, uh, uh, like published information in, in newspaper. So uh, let me share about my journey of faith and let me share what I learned about love during this, uh, this war. And war and love, you know, it, it seems that they don't come together, but they do. Uh, as a missiologist, I was uh, uh, thinking a lot about uh, God and mission of the church during this war. So I believe that Holy Trinity is the source of mission. We are participating in God's mission. Uh, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So we are continuing that, that mission. And Trinity, it's a love, fellowship, and wholeness. So I believe that mission is the voice, feet, and hands of God's love. It is an embrace of God's love. So few stories. Uh, all of those pictures I made, and I witnessed those stories. And these stories provoke me to think about God and love. And I hope that one day I, I will write a book, Mission After Bucha, because I live in Bucha. My apartment is in the city of Bucha. And now this city is famous for uh, atrocities. We were delivering food for one location in the city of Hostomel. And this lady that on photo, she said that her son had an operation, surgery on his eyes and he deadly needs some special lenses, otherwise he might become blind. Well, you can't find such lenses. You know, everything is closed down. And we were able to get to such remote place because of our ministry and because of our relationship with Ukrainian army. Every morning we would get a password. And if you are not a Ukrainian, you will never pronounce that word. And of course we had some, some uh, additional documents. And miracle happens. We shared with our friends, they shared with their friends. Making this story short, we were able to deliver those lenses from Germany. When we came and gave these lenses to this gentleman, they were blown away, like, who are you? <laughs> like, how this can happen? So, and uh, I learned that love gives vision to the unfamil unfamiliar neighbor. And we developed this phrase, unfamiliar neighbor. It's again, contradiction. We don't know their names. I don't know their names, but they are my neighbor. And Fyodor, uh, he is the head of our theology department. He said, okay, this man will put that lenses on his eyes. What kind of Ukraine he will see? And it was very hard, hard question. Love comprises the whole person. Love is integral. There is a city of Irpin and a bridge which was destroyed. And now it, we call that bridge, bridge of hope. If you manage to go under, then you are in a relatively safe place and you can be taken to the train station, downtown Kiev, and you can be evacuated. So sometimes just all day round, we would go back and forth, taking people from that bridge and delivering them to, um, to the train station. We don't know this lady name, but she had two children and we provided, you know, this support for her in order to deliver her and other people to a train station. It was so interesting. You know, we are driving and then people start to ask how much it will cost because it's like a 30 kilometers. And we say, well, it's for free. How it is for free? Well, you know, we are Christians and this is, this is our, our, our mission to help. And then you hear how they are whispering. Yes, they are Christians. They help people like we are. So um, this is my friend, co-pastor, and he is a, one of the leaders of Ukrainian Bible Society, where we stayed for more than a month. It was our base because uh, my city was occupied, seminary was hit by Russian missiles. 
And I, I like this photo because I see how he like almost kneeled down to the level of a ch child's eyes. And he is giving him a child, a uh, Bible for child. And uh, I see that Lao shares God's word face to face. Lao help us to go down and to speak with people on their level. And for me, it's a great example for mission. This is my best photo that I made. Again, this is a city of Hostomel. And uh, we, delivering, we were delivering food, water. And this lady uh, showed up. And uh, there is our, it is our student. His name is Michael. And this lady, she shared that her, her husband was killed. And she buried his body in a like, backyard. 2022 outside. Can you imagine that somebody is doing this thing? And then she started to cry and she started to, to hug our student. And previous photo is like, Michael is staying like this. He, he, he has no idea what to do because just he see this lady just for the first time in his life. And then he gave uh, her a, a hug. So I, uh, I think a lot now about theology of a hug. And we received more hugs from strangers for these 15 months than from our family members during the last 15 years. Because in this situation, you know, people were struggling how to express the uh, appreciation. And they, they physically survived because food we, we brought, water or medicine. So the only thing they could do for us is to give us a hug. Uh, second, you, you won't see details on this picture, but... Um, we were in the city of Bakhmut. Now it is taken and destroyed city on the east part of Ukraine. And we were informed that there is a um, 74 years gentleman who needs to be evacuated. All of his village left and he left behind by, with his uh, wife. And of course, we wanted to be heroes. We said, if everybody denied, like refused to help, you know, we will help. However, when we arrived to his house in a small village, we understood why other people refused to help because he was paralyzed and in a very poor condition. And it was not clear, will he make that right or not? And definitely you don't want somebody to die in your bus. Since the situation was very critical and Russian soldiers were really closed, we decided to help him. So we took just his body together with his mattress we put in a seminary bus and we drove for 450 kilometers. When he was coughing, I was so happy because, oh, he is alive. Praise God, he is alive. So when we arrived uh, to our destination and I opened the door uh, of in our bus, I saw that our student, his name is Oleg. He is uh, our students of our worship studies department. All of these 400 kilometers, he was close to that gentleman and he was holding his hand. And it really touched me. And at that moment, I realized if this is our student, I want to be a seminary president for, for more time. So I became to, came to conclusion that love holds the hand of a stranger in time of a crisis. And this is for me a great example of incarnational mission. We are there. We are with people. This photo is made in our canteen at UETS. And now we are providing every week for many months, we are providing 1,500 hot meals per week for people from our community. And we made a decision that we will do this in a way that we will protect their dignity. So uh, we call them guests. So when we speak with our team, when we want to refer to those group of people, oh, our guests arrive or our guests not arrive. And they, we share the same food. We, we eat together. If I am served, they are served. And uh, it is awkward for me to, this, to say this because, of course, I want everybody to come to Jesus. But at this moment, we decide to minimize our preaching. Maximum what we do, we feed them a Lord's Prayer, prayer for a need. And then we say, if you want, if you want spiritual support, we are here. If you want counseling, we are here, but you are not um, uh, obligated to, 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 to come to our churches in order to have food. 
So now we have a joke with our faculty that when sometimes Jesus is present in our classrooms when we're interpreting the Bible. More often he is in our chapel when we worship him. But he always in our canteen when we break bread with our neighbors. And this reminds us a story when Jesus met two disciples when they were going to the city of Emmaus. When he was interpreting the Old Testament to them, they were blind. They didn't recognize him. But as soon as he broke the bread, the light, eyes were opened. So we believe that many eyes now are open in our canteen. And it's so funny, there was one gentleman, he was really against our seminary, our church. So he survived because of this food, and now he's a member of a church. Nobody forced him to come, but he came. Some strong um, outcomes. To love is to have the same scars people have. Compassion is to suffer together and suffer in the same way. I was teaching a lot about compassion before the war, how strong this feeling is, how it have to bring to actions. Now my definition for compassion is to suffer together with people and to suffer uh, in the same way, to have the same scars people have. This is our canteen. You see holes from explosions. There is no windows. And uh, when I was visiting Bucha as a, as, as a, as a uh, pastor, and we started to use collars in order to be recognizable, so people can see the church is present, and if they have spiritual needs, they can approach us. Because if you have, if you have a tie, oh, you may look like looking nice, but like a governor or businessman. So people don't know that they can take uh, uh, help from, from you. And by the way, now in Ukraine, we don't use tie. It's our covenant. Until the victory, we, we have no tie. So sometimes when I'm speaking with people, they are not looking for answers. They are looking for sympathy. And they want to be sure if I speak from within the context or from outside. So sometimes I tell them, friends, I have theological education, but I have no answers. But I know, what do you feel? Because my apartment was looted, my campus was hit, I had to run funeral for my graduates, for my staff, and my graduates were, they were murdered. So I know, I know what you are talking about. And this compassion and this presence and same scars making our ministry authentic. I am serving communion quite often as a pastor. However, the most... The, the strongest feeling of God's presence that I ever experienced, it was in the middle of nowhere in the forest when we, are, when we were serving communion for our soldiers. When you give bread and wine for soldiers, you see that for some of them, this is the first communion they ever had. And you are sure that for some of them, this is the, the last one. And when in the forest you say, Jesus was crucified for you, and soldier having his gun, he says, Amen. God, God, was, God was there. It was sometimes funny because one battalion was inviting us was three or four times. And the commander said, you know, we noticed after we started have, having communion regularly, nobody was killed or, or, or wounded. So we want to have it more regularly. So God's love invites us for his, uh, to his table. And uh, the last one, love goes extra mile. One day I got a phone call from a, one gentleman and he said that uh, he has a special request for me. And I said, okay, how can we help you? And he said, he, he shared story of his parents. They were killed because of bomb. It took a few days to, to find the bodies and then to identify the bodies. And since you can't travel at that moment, you can't have funeral for your parents. So he asked, can you help me to deliver my parents' body from a morgue to my village? Yes, we, we will do it. So um, using our seminary bus, we were delivering dead bodies. Nobody taught me how to do it. I have never thought that uh, we will serve in this way. But this is what integral mission is about. Later, he called me and he said, you know, uh, we have some fruits I want to give you. And I say, no, no, we don't need it. And my wife, she just hit me like, you have to go and take the fruits. 
because it's important for people to express their gratitude. So this was the most radical thing that I was doing. And uh, we see that love is stronger than death. God, is, God has the final word and his mission will be accomplished. In every town in Ukraine, in the beginning and end of the town, we have the cross. And you see there is a cross and there is a Russian missile. So um, we are shaken in Ukraine, but we are not broken. And as a seminary, we were able to resume our ministry. And because of support, especially from the Outreach Foundation, we had resources to restore our campus, to continue our education, especially specific training for this moment, and also to take care about our people. Now church has the highest credibility ever because thousands and thousands of people have been physically saved because of churches. So our dream is, okay, how we as a church can navigate our society. So now we are not thinking only about churches. We see a bigger mission, society, entire Ukraine. How do we navigate our society to this crisis? And what we see in future, I thought that we will be jumping and dancing after the victory. No, it's clear for us that we will cry and lamentation will be long. And then we see that there will be trauma healing process. How do we equip Christians to take trauma seriously and to serve people who experience trauma? And then we hope and we pray that slowly we will think and speak and maybe make some small steps toward forgiveness and reconciliation. I don't see as a community besides the church that has this capacity to facilitate this very complicated process. So our vision is to serve the church and then the church can transform our society. So uh, this is what we do uh, briefly um, when we will have a, a, a lunch with some people related to military. I will share you the other side that we do uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. But we are not pacifist anymore. I'm, I'm sorry if I will, uh, you know, uh, if you don't like this phrase, we are not pacifist because we realize that our pacifism was developed in a greenhouse. It sounds really cool, spiritual, nice, but we had no idea what does it mean when you are attacked, when people you love are being killed. So, um, yeah. Thank you for your time. And maybe if you have time for questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Thank you for being here. How do you think this whole nightmare will come to an end? What will make it end and be peace there? Well, uh, it's a very hard question. Uh, we have hope and we want to do everything in order to, um, to win this war. Because we realize that there is no space for the Ukrainian identity under Russian dominion. And this is, my friends, this is a national movement in Ukraine when everybody, everybody from young and old want to contribute something. So uh, our fear that it might be frozen conflict. It is clear that Russia lost its capacity to go forward but we are not sure that we have capacity to push them away. And this is where you uh, can be very helpful. So do ad advocacy on our behalf. You, I heard a comment from one uh, person that your president is very bold and he almost like require everything. Well, when you are attacked by a giant, you don't think about diplomacy or all that stuff. You know, you speak as it is. But there is a reason, that actually there are two reasons why we ask for support. Because in 1995, we made a deal with the United States, Great Britain, and the Russian Federation. They told us, if you will give away your large, largest in Europe nuclear arsenal, we will guarantee your protection and freedom. It was the best deal, as we thought. So now we feel that we have rights to request. And second, my friends, democracy and justice, it's a global phenomenon. Martin Luther King said once, 
Injustice somewhere is a threat for justice everywhere. I came to conclusion that you can't enjoy the sweet taste of freedom and justice and democracy in your country if there is a small country who is being killed and destroyed just because that country wants to have democracy. So if Ukraine, uh, if Ukraine will fail, that taste of justice and democracy will never be sweet. It will have some Ukrainian blood taste. This you may consider it as a kind of ma manipulation probably, but forgive me, I am from Ukraine. But we can't celebrate justice when people, you know, what we want, we want to be independent, democratic, just country, which celebrates religious freedom. We have freedom in Ukraine. We have been for 70 years persecuted under the Soviet Union. And now we rejoice our freedom. We don't want to go, go come back. So this is the way how you can help. Thank you. My question is, is what types of things can the American church do for your for the Ukrainian church? What, what types of things, either physical or, or spiritual, do you need? Um, of course, everybody says, puts prayer first. You know, then you sound uh, spiritual. But this this war uh, taught me that uh, God works. This war taught me that uh, I learned not to make final conclusions because sometimes I was one hundred percent sure that God was absent. But then, in a while, when I was looking back, I was able to see that He was right there. I have, for example, when people ask me how Russians left. Kiev's area, they almost surrounded Kiev. We could see them. And then they just left. So when people ask me how it happened, I said to them, well, I don't have non-religious explanation because the only answer that I have, it is God. So pray for us. Share your expertise, your competence, like trauma counseling. We don't have that, that competence. A chaplaincy. We have a uh, chaplaincy ministry supported by the government. This is absolutely new thing for us, for entire country. Please support us in, um, in our educational ministry. So our pastors, they will have relevant training. They can address challenges and problems people have. Support us financially if you have resources in our relief ministry. We are in the middle of humanitarian crisis. People have problems with food, with medicine, with water. And this is, a, is, this is not an opportunity for witness. This is our obligation, first of all, as a human. So we do our relief ministry following two reasons. Anthropological, because we see suffering of people. And then, of course, we have some mesiological, but anthropology goes first. So there is a huge need. And... Um, and the, uh, what I shared just before, uh, do advocacy on behalf of Ukraine before your uh, governance, before your president. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the humanitarian and uh, uh, activities at your seminary. You know, a school that you know well, our church has supported since the middle 90s, uh, is the ETS, Evangelical Theological Seminary in Osiak. And during the war there, um, in addition to the seminary going on, they had a, a significant humanitarian outreach to all the, different, all the different ethnic groups that were involved in the war. So how do you as a seminary continue classes, but have sort of 1,500 meals a week? I mean, how, in terms of people or resources, how is that possible? Well, uh, thank you for your question. Um, you know, it was not a hard decision. Sometimes people say, oh, you, you stayed in Bucha, in Kiev. Maybe it was a hard decision. No, it was clear for me. I, I, I want to be there. First, we have a good team. And uh, we realize that we, you know, if we will not help, people will die. This is not about to have better food or more food. More pe some people, the, the only food they have, this is the food that we provide. So it's not a question. And let me underline this. On 24th of February 2022, we had almost nothing 
to share with our society, just our lives and our time. We are able to share food and provision only because there are faithful and generous and compassionate people, for example, here in the United States. So we receive funds, we receive humanitarian aid, and then we share. So we are not the source of that help, we are channels. So uh, without a global church, you know, we would be very limited. Yes, we would be together with our people, but uh, so thank you for your compassion and your generosity. Um, how big is your staff at the seminary and how do you keep them motivated and um, encouraged? We have 50 full-time workers. We are... We are driven by a certain level of adrenaline. You know, we know that uh, next day after victory, we will crash because that adrenaline will be over. So we are tired. I, I, you know, I would be, you know, happy to say no, everything. No, it's hard. It is hard because every single day, every single night, we are shelled and, uh, I wanted to show you some video, but I had no time. You know, sometimes from my apartment in Bucha, I can see Russian kamikaze drone flying over our house. And then you see how our army tried to destroy it. And then, and Russians, they start the shelling at 3 a.m. and it goes till 5 a.m. And you, you have this siren. So entire nation has no sleep. So they just to want to exhaust us. And then during the winter, they try to destroy our power infrastructure. So every single apartment and house was at least 12 hours without power every single day. And in our context, if you have no power, you have no heating, no water, nothing. And one of the projects, for example, we had during winter, we call it winterization, when we provided firewood and stoves for people. It's very, you know, strange situation. You live in a forest, but you have to be provided with firewood because a forest is mined. You can't go to take wood because, you know, there are mines. And, you know, we are grateful for our partners that so many people, they survive during winter because they have that uh, firewood. So, um, we are energized by some kind of uh, adrenaline and also, um, well, this is our country, this is our people. So, and uh, we don't see other institutions that can help beside the church. So, and now, you know, seminary became a, a, a hub for our community. And we also go to the east part of Ukraine. And it was interesting experience when we were delivering food to the bomb shelters. It was interesting to see when an Orthodox priest was coming to have lunch to our seminary. So uh, it's not a hard question because you can't do it in other way when you see suffering. Thank you uh, for being here today. Um, my roommate in college was the child of Ukrainian refugees from the Stalin period. And, and so... As you spoke, you said there was no room in Russia for a Ukrainian identity. Could you describe yeah. Ukrainian identity? Uh, Ukrainian identity, it's uh, Ukrainian language, Ukrainian re religiosity, and Ukrainian culture. Uh, Ukrainian language has been banned hundreds of times. And Russia was imposing Russian language. Ukrainians, we are we are Christians. We 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 love to practice our religion, and churches have been heavily persecuted. So, I grew up. I was born in the Soviet Union, and my family, my parents, were members of underground church. I still have memory being a child to going to worship with them in a forest, or sh uh, shifting from house to house. First and second pastor of our church, they were in prison and in prison for 10 and 5 years. So we have this memory. And uh, uh, we see what Russians are doing on the cities that they occupied. They destroy Ukrainian schools. They destroy Ukrainian libraries. 
they persecute Ukrainian religious leaders. And several of our pastors and, and bishops, they have, they've, they've been uh, kidnapped. So this is, uh, and you know, friends, in 1991, the border of Ukrainian uh, uh, country was recognized. How we can afford that somebody decided to change that? And uh, so uh, for us to quit this fight is equal to commit a suicide. Could you comment a bit on the split of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the Russian Orthodox Church and the impact on this situation? Yeah, uh, I know that you have been told, maybe you heard uh, that uh, in Ukraine, Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, of Moscow Patriarchate is persecuted. It's not true. It is not true. Our president does not persecute the church. In Ukraine, we have really great uh, inter-church uh, dialogue and partnership and freedom. What our government wants and what our society supports that you can be governed as a church from somebody in the in Moscow who publicly officially blessed this war. And Ukrainian Orthodox priests, they had a huge dilemma. They have a funeral of a Ukrainian soldier who was killed by the Russian army. And according to the liturgy, they have to bless Patriarch Kirill. So, and like how you can combine these two? So the, the question that our government and society has, that this church cannot be governed by, uh, by people in Russia. But they have all freedom to practice the religion as uh, any other, e and even more than some evangelicals may, may have. But in Ukraine, we have this gift of religious freedom. When we can come together with all churches, with our government, and we are not persecuted. So uh, it's not true when we, you, if you will hear that in Ukraine there is a religious persecution, this is not true. Thank you. I just returned from Madova and um, we do a lot of things with the fa poor families and the orphans there. And we provided firewood and food throughout the winter for as many families as we could. When I was staying at UDG, I met students who were volunteering to go to Turkey to work with orphans from Ukraine. And I was just hoping maybe you could elaborate on the situation for orphans in the country, because we heard that Russia was taking the orphans and trying to indoctrinate them. Uh, thank you. This is a very uh, good question. The most vulnerable were those who have had no families, like people, elderly people in some hospitals and uh, orphans. And when they were, they tried them to, you know, to evacuate them. So it's a big problem. And who will take care about, about them? So uh, helping uh, orphans is crucial at, the, at this moment. And we are also um, traumatized by the fact that Russians, they deported thousands of Ukrainian children to Russia. They changed their names, dates of birth. So, uh, and this is the reason why international court uh, uh, recognized Putin as guilty. So he will be uh, arrested if he will be traveling uh, internationally. So this is a huge social, uh, uh, huge problem. And again, now our government is consider, uh, concentrated on the war and we are happy for this. Who will take care about such people if church will not take care? So to equip the church with proper understanding and resources is priority number one. And this is not just about spiritual things. This is about holistic because we are speaking of saving lives, physical lives of people and, and, and children. So uh, and another problem is uh, human trafficking. We will be shocked after the war to learn how many people were victims of human trafficking? Well, 
you mentioned your wife. I would love to know about your family, Yvonne. Thank you. Yeah, um, I am married. Uh, we have no children yet. Uh, my wife, uh, she works for business. And another thing that we learned that all of our ideas about war, it, they were wrong. You never know who you are and how you will act. We, ha we have seen strong men, they just crushed and disappeared during the first day of the war. And we've seen, and we have small, tiny ladies who demonstrate courage, leadership, that so sometimes we have some kind of envy, you know. So I am grateful to my wife. Uh, it took me a couple of months to realize this, that she never left Ukraine. For a month, she left to West Ukraine because she had to evacuate her cousins and their children. It was another miracle. And then she came back uh, to Kiev. So we are together because thousands and thousands and thousands of families are separated. So I truly appreciate your help. She, she, uh, she uh, is working for business, but she also support uh, and help us in our uh, relief ministry. So, yeah. Thank you for this question. We thank you for Ivan, for his courage, uh, for his faithfulness to you in the midst of uh, this traumatizing, uh, destructive situation that his, he and his country face. Um, Lord, be present, be present through him encourage your people keep them safe and bring peace lord these are sighs too deep for words help us to continue to know best how we can care and to show our solidarity and support with brothers and sisters neighbors that we do not know be with us as we Move on to worship and continue this day and help us to be more faithful to you because of the time that we have spent together in fellowship. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.